Botswana appear to be far more timid than consumers in more industrialized nations when it comes to exercising their rights as consumers. One of the leading voices that has materialized on the subject of consumer rights and education in the country is Consumer Watchdog, a privately owned company registered in Botswana and based in Gaborone, and also a division of Business and Enterprise Solutions Botswana. Richard and Kate Harriman are essentially, however, a couple that has taken it upon themselves to address this dearth in consumer protection, partner with government on behalf of consumers, and assert consumer rights. We were curious to find out what would motivate these founders of Consumer Watchdog to sacrifice their own time and resources to partake in this form of activism to the extent of sometimes having to endure death threats from some of the more unscrupulous individuals they expose. I am Nameto Sibina and this is First Issues. Welcome back to First Issues. Uh -huh. To begin our conversation with the Harrimans, we asked what inspired them to form Consumer Watchdog. For me, it was the lack of customer service standards that we saw in Botswana and also the disrespect that we saw a lot of stores portraying towards their customers. We were seeing things that weren't just irritating, they weren't just disrespectful. They made us really, really angry. I mean, in stores that were selling on credit of, with interest rates of in excess of 300% a year, that made us really, really angry. That shouldn't be allowed to happen. And stores needed to start communicating with people more to say, look, this is what we're going to charge you. Um, and educate consumers a little bit about, about getting into those sort of agreements or not getting into those agreements. I think the other thing we wanted to see was consumers standing up for their rights. And there have been so many situations where I've been in a store and see someone being abused, basically uh, by a store manager being told, no, we're not going to refund you even though something's gone wrong, and consumers just taking it. And we really wanted consumers to stand up for their rights and say, no, this isn't good enough. Having motivated much of the nation to stand up for their rights as consumers and intervening on their behalf in the case of unscrupulous retailers and service providers, how exactly have these business entities received Consumer Watchdog and their activities? There's a very small proportion that finds us incredibly irritating. Um, but that's a good sign because some organisations deserve to be irritated because they are disrespecting their customers, they're treating them with contempt. We can distinguish between two types of companies. Those that are mature enough to say things go wrong and let, thank you for bringing it to our attention, let's put it right. And those organisations that get defensive and huff and puff and start screaming and shouting at us saying, who are we to come and invest or raise a concern with them. Consumer rights cover a wide spectrum of issues. What have been Kate and Rich's pet projects thus far? For me, the ones that, that I get most involved with are probably the scams that are out there. Not just issues of customer service where it's gone wrong. Um, it's the pyramid schemes, the Ponzi schemes, the investment scheme, the fake investment schemes out there that, that, that are scams, where people lose huge amounts of money um, that's stolen from them on the, the basis of either making lots of money in return. The pyramid scheme issue, we've had a lot of issues with pyramid schemes. Um, with multi-level marketing schemes, the respectable end, uh, where there's actually a product, but we've seen so many pyramid schemes that have come and gone, where people join and then they're encouraged to recruit people beneath them who recruit people beneath them, um, and money somehow, in, in theory, flows up through this pyramid to the person who joins. Uh, these never work. Never, ever work. No pyramid scheme makes money for anyone except the person who founds it. We've seen people who've cashed in insurance policies of half a million pula and given it to a supposed invest investment scheme far, far, far away. Um, and that money will never come back. They might appear to get some interest on it on a website somewhere. They might even get small amounts of money back, but that half a million has gone. That capital has disappeared. Uh, the most recent one we've discovered is actually run by some Latvian gun runners, I mean, proper criminals. Uh, it isn't just, um, most, pe most people's image of a scammer is some guy in a Nigerian internet cafe 
getting a few people to part with a small amount of money. It's organised crime these days. I think for me it's the smaller issues you see in stores where you have to fight for your rights. Um, a typical example is buying a cell phone and it goes wrong a week later and you're told no, no, we can't help you in Botswana, you must phone this free call centre number in South Africa, knowing full well that the call centre number doesn't work from Botswana. So for me, that's a, a continuing one. I mean, basic customer service standards. Why should everything be a fight? It doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be. Many Botswana are excited to buy something on credit, but get frustrated when the amount they eventually pay is exponential to the actual price and wonder how they could have missed such an important detail. Kate and Richard were happy to share with us the observations that they have made and the work they have done with regards to store credit. We found that when things were advertised for credit in the newspapers, furniture stores advertised things, they were giving you know, the, ins the installments you have to pay, the deposit you have to pay, but they were never giving the total amount to be repaid. And we discovered a little bit of law from 1974 which required that to be disclosed, even in characters of a similar size, it says. Uh, and we contacted the furniture stores uh, and said, did you know that the law says you must disclose this? And to their credit, a couple of the stores came back to us immediately and said, no, sorry, we didn't know, and we'll fix this right now. And within weeks, it was fixed. A couple of the other stores um, from across the border um, elected to ignore us. And more than, worse than ignoring us, that's not the worst thing in the world, they were ignoring the law of the country in which they operated. One of them even said that they abide by South African law. Now that's nice in South Africa, but we're not in South Africa. We're in Botswana and Botswana law applies. One of the things we found on store credit is often companies won't let you see the agreement before you actually sign. So although you go in and say, please tell me how much will it cost me, please let me know what I'm going to be paying for, and you say, can I take an agreement away so I can read it before I make the decision, which is the right thing to do, they won't let you. And the reason they won't let you is they don't want you to be empowered and they don't want you to see the horrendous charges they're going to apply to your account. You know, a typical one we found a few years ago, I think it was a DVD player that cost 399 pula cash. The total price on credit was over, I think it was 1,700 1, pula. Now, if you inform consumers of that up front, I would hope that some people will make the decision to say, no, no, I'll save for that item before I buy it, rather than paying for you know, nearly 2,000 pula in cash. Richard had quite a few words to say about the tendency by some stores to make customers sign for goods they are yet to receive. There was a contract we saw, a store credit contract, uh, for when someone bought a piece of furniture. And when you sign the contract in the store, you sign one clause which says, and I've inspected the goods and they are satisfactory. But they haven't been delivered yet. It's not going to be delivered for another week. But you already signed a form saying, the goods are perfect. And I, I've seen them. Uh, and that's just, well, first of all, it's legally nonsensical. You can't make someone, that's, it's an unenforceable. But the power situation is that the consumer has no power in that contract. They don't think they have the contract's full of Latin and is printed in letters this big and it's a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy so you can't read it anyway. Um, and those, that's, ab that's, that's scandalous abuse. Mm -hmm. And one, sooner or later, someone's going to end up in the high court challenging these contracts and they're going to win. The stores are going to lose because this is illegal. You can't do this. You can't force someone to abide by a contract. The other thing that they do with store credit is if you get into difficulties, often people will say, I handed back the goods. And what stores aren't doing is saying to the consumer, thank you for returning the sofa that you bought on credit, but you still have a balance outstanding. And what we're picking up is many years later, customers are being chased by debt collectors, not realising that there was still a debt outstanding that's had interest applied to it for a number of years. So people land up with being blacklisted with ITC, still owing maybe six, 7,000 pula on the sofa that they bought and the sofa that they handed back. So again, it's about their a responsibility of a store to actually explain their procedure to a customer, not just say, thank you for handing back the goods, that's the end of it. The other thing I think with store credit is we see a lot of verbal agreements that go wrong. So for example, a customer will go in and say, no, no, the store uh, cashier said I can have it on interest-free credit over three months. It's not written down, three months come and goes, interest gets applied to the account and there's an error. The cashier's left the store 
uh, and the, the consumer is left with um, a problem. So we would like to see much more responsibility on the part of stores to educate their consumers. People often think that we're somehow lagging behind in Botswana. We have excellent consumer protection laws here. Um, the Consumer Protection Act and regulations, the Control of Goods marking, uh, marking of Goods regulations, uh, the Food Control Act, the Public Health regulations, we're very well protected legally. What I think we lack is some enforcement of those, those rules. Well, what's worse is we lack education on those laws, on the protections we have, the rights we have. Uh, I would love to see teenagers in school be taught about their consumer rights. First of all, because kids, every kid we've spoken to about this thinks it's really interesting that they can go into a store and say, no, no, you can't do that to me. But also it's a huge protection for kids when they get out of school, come out of university, and they get their first job. They urgently need to know when they open their bank account or go and get a loan from somewhere or rent a house that they have certain rights, they have certain protections. They have obligations as well, but they have rights and protections that will help them when things go wrong. Join us after the break as we continue our discussion with the founders of Consumer Watchdog. Welcome back to First Issues as we interrogate the subject of consumer rights with a couple that has endured much personal sacrifice and even endured death threats in a bid to make sure that Botswana exercise their rights in this regard. How do these unethical practices continue to flourish? Where could we as a nation be getting it wrong when it comes to protecting the rights of the consumer? One of the issues is we haven't really explored in great detail, but people should know about, stores in particular should know about, is that the Consumer Protection Regulations forbid an organisation from causing a probability of confusion about the language of an agreement. Now, I think that means, in, in one way that means don't use long words to confuse people. It also means, I think, and probably contract law applies as well, if someone clearly only speaks Setswana and you make them sign an agreement in English, I'm not a lawyer, but is that really an agreement? If they can't understand it, they can't read it. And they're certainly not allowed to cause this probability of confusion based on language. And stores really need to start addressing that because plenty of their customers either speak very little English or no English, English at all, but they're made to sign an agreement in English. It's a bit like asking me to sign an agreement in Chinese. It, it would be ludicrous, and, and everyone would understand that's ridiculous. But so why do they do it with English and Setswana here? And as Kate said, I think it's some of the stores do it because they really don't want people to understand what the contract says, uh, because they know that the customer wouldn't sign it if they actually understood it, if they understood what might happen to them, what's almost certainly going to happen to them. In all our talk of consumer rights and issues, we asked our guests to give their understanding of the concept. The consumer has a right to respect. So regardless of, of what goes wrong, um, a store should actually honour their obligations. And for example, if, a, if something's broken, they should offer a replacement or a refund for the consumer. And that should be done with a smile on their face without causing a fight or an, an argument. I think a consumer has right to courtesy and respect. And I'm not saying that a customer is always right because occasionally customers also make mistakes or they sign agreements they know they, sh they can't afford and they don't honour their commitments. So it's, it's not a, a one-way street, it is a two-way street. But I think um, stores have an obligation to provide more information to consumers before they buy something or before they sign an agreement. One really useful resource that consumers should know about is that all of the laws of Botswana are online. You can go to the internet and you can read every one of our laws up to, I think they're a few months out of date, but it's gradually being updated. Um, it's elaws.gov.bw. Go there, and it, it's a fairly simple website. You can browse off, browse through and print off the laws yourself. And the great thing that we have is that, that all of our laws that I've seen are written very simply. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand the consumer protection regulations. It's written in a very straightforward, simple fashion. You just need a basic command of English, and you can read our laws. Go and download the penal code. Go and download the consumer protection regulations and the public health regulations. They're really useful things to, to, to have in your arsenal. It's useful to know when you go to a restaurant what can and can't be done. 
how you can be treated in a store, what they can and can't do. How exactly does Consumer Watchdog sustain and fund its activities? No money changes hands other than the payments for the newspaper columns. Um, we don't cost our time financially for Watchdog, but it probably takes a couple of days a week for each of us. So we could probably, if we wanted to, we could do the maths and work out how much it's costing us, the opportunity cost of that. But um, I have this rather old-fashioned view that if you take, you must give as well. Um, and it's enormously satisfying to give something back, particularly if we're helping people and trying to make things a little bit better. It's also incredibly selfish. I mean, I get a real kick out of fixing someone's problem for them. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's enormously satisfying when we get an email from someone or from an organization saying, we've, we've listened to what you've said and we've, we've changed our policy on this. We're now going to do this instead of that. That's enormously satisfying. But I mean, I'll just give you a, a, a quick example. A few, um, not long ago, we actually had a call from someone who'd bought a brand new phone, or what they thought was a brand new phone, for 6,000 Pula. And they were rather surprised to find photos and music on the phone mm. when they got it. And to cut a long story short, we actually took it back to the organisation that sold it to them, who said it was a mistake, and they refunded the customer in full. And they gave him a new phone. Yeah. They then came back a few days later saying, we've got a brand new phone of equal value for the customer to say sorry. Or one of the cases we dealt with was a, a lady who had fallen over some, sh um, some shelving on the floor in a shop and injured herself. And we were actually able to get her compensation, um, not just for her costs, but actually to say sorry and an apology. And for, I think for, you know, for us to be able to say, you know, we stood up for someone's right and they got what they deserve, they had justice, is, is very satisfying. Our guests have dealt with a variety of cases, from fake investment schemes and other scams, to basic customer service complaints and the abuse of authority by service providers. From all these cases, which have yielded the most interesting experiences? The one that struck me, one of the ones that struck me most, was we criticised a large multi-level marketing organisation. Um, they're not a pyramid scheme, but they're, they're, they're pyramid structured, but they, they have products. It's a world famous multi-level marketing scheme. And we criticized them. Um, and to their credit, I mean, the managing director from South Africa was on the phone very quickly and she, she was very pleasant, no legal threats or anything. And she came and visited us in Botswana um, to put her side of the story, which was good of her, so no nastiness. Um, but she offered to send, to pay for the entire Consumer Watchdog team to travel down to their headquarters in South Africa. We were going to be put up in, for a week in Cape Town. And I thought, this is extraordinary. What is going to, and obviously, we said no. Much as I would have loved, we would have loved to have a week in Cape Town paid for by someone else. Um, it would have compromised our values and our standards. And we know for sure there would have been a photographer there. Kate and Richard Harriman from Consumer Watchdog viewing the headquarters of this organization and it would have been on their website and that would have shut us up um, but we didn't but it was it was interesting to see how important this organization saw it to fly their managing director to a different country to come and see these two obscure people um, and very nicely to try and shut us up we've had many offers over the years of trips to go in, in, and visit companies or for, on one occasion, a company offered us a free car. And we've always said, no, thank you. We won't even accept a cup of tea because we need to be completely neutral. And the companies that we actually work for for money understand that there is a line that we don't cross um, and that the work we do for Consumer Watchdog is entirely independent. And we stick to our principles. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. In its years of operation, Consumer Watchdog has exposed and corrected many unethical practices and made gains in the area of store credit procedures. Having mentioned the need for consumer rights education in Botswana, what other aspirations does this entity have with regards to consumer rights in the country? Well, next year is our 10th anniversary, so we're planning some special things uh, for next year, which you'll hear about next year. <laughs> I think my hope is that we can continue to educate consumers so that consumers don't need us. 
that they can do it for themselves and that people understand what their rights are before they get into a situation where they need help. And more than that, that stores actually start treating people with the respect that they deserve. I'd like to see our country become a country that's known to be a place where you don't abuse people. Um, you see it a lot, particularly with, unfortunately, with some of the, the South African companies that are of the older mindset. Not that there's plenty of South African companies that are brilliant, but there are some that are still rather old-fashioned in their views, and they think they can come to Botswana and treat us badly. Um, you see it a lot with scams, the investment scheme scams and the pyramid schemes. They think they can come to Botswana and get away with this. I would love to see us known as a country where, no, no let's skip Botswana. They're, not as skept, they're, they're a bit more sceptical than they used to be. They're not as gullible as they used to be. This isn't a country where you come to to rip people off. Um, it's always going to happen to some extent, but I'd like our reputation to be as a country that's peaceful, democratic, friendly, warm, and so on, but not a country that you tangle with because we're a bit sceptical and we don't fall for things that easily. Where some may have accepted the status quo with regards to service providers and retailers' abuse of consumers' lack of knowledge and apathy, Kate and Richard have committed to continue to change this environment against all odds. As Jack Kemp says, the power of one man or one woman doing the right thing for the right reason at the right time is the greatest influence in our society. From me, Namezo Sibina, the team behind First Issues, and our sponsors, First National Bank, we wish you a good night and pleasant viewing. <laughs>